There hasn't been a murder in Lant in over a decade. Asbel swore that as long as he is Lord of Lant, blood would never darken the streets of his province again. Highland's war is over. Leave the battle with Olympias to the rest of the world. They did their part. Yet, as Viscera zigzags through the cobblestones of Lant Port, Asbel can't help but feel the war claw at their doors again. It's very small town to round up a posse, but the show of power puts people at ease. Prayers of thanks and relief just float by them. The body is only covered by a sheet. Even with the clouds looming thick overhead, there's enough light to catch the shine of wet gore, not just on the ground, but splattered on nearby windows. A few Lant guardsmen bow, a motion he's never really cared for. As he approaches the body, crouching down, as Bill bends his head in prayer for the woman's departed soul, the guardsmen follow, having forgotten to pay their respects amid the pandemonium. A moment of steely silence later, as Bell gently lifts the shroud to see the still, wide-eyed face of Victoria Bell, former major in the Windor Army, an infamous town shrew, staring back. She was a miserable curse of a woman. If she showed up at your door, you're sentenced to seven years' bad luck. As Bell has heaps of petitions from her, anything from banning children from playing with toys within fifty feet of her house or requesting that guards not greet people when they pass her in the street. Apparently, it isn't their job to be friendly. He served with her in the war. Her merciless training routines are legendary. Gods forbid you mess up. Her ridicule was also mythical. She got married after the war, but was so terrible to the poor man that he left Lant and all his money to get away from her. Since then, Asbel, his wife Sharia, and all her neighbors tried to reach out to her, but they were always rejected. Still, no one deserves to be slaughtered in the street. The former major approached the murderer first. We'd received complaints about her being particularly aggressive with refugees and immigrants, Captain Bailey says. As Bell vaguely recalls a petition for outsiders to be immediately identifiable, claiming that she and her neighbors were being watched. He gently closes the older woman's eyes and examines the body. There is a brief altercation. Witnesses that were close enough say Bell pulled a knife on her. Well, that checks out. Otherwise, the murderer retaliates almost immediately and... He gestures to the grisly scene. She slashed right across the middle as if by a giant claw. The murderer struck decisively, knowing that one blow would be enough. No weapon can cause such a wound. An art this powerful would take time to cast. Where's the killer now? Asbel asks. She's being held in the prison, but I'll be honest, I don't think it will hold her if she decides to escape, Bailey admits. You did great bringing her in, Asbel says reassuringly. Bailey disagrees. She surrendered and demanded to speak with whoever's in charge of this town, and she's refused legal or religious counsel since. Asbel takes this in for a moment. Victoria had been quiet the last week or so, so he hadn't received any complaints from or about her. Until now, all refugees from the war have been peaceful, willing to work for any sum, and desperate to get to the Amarcian Enclave. But the killer had asked about what ships were going to Strata. That doesn't add up, considering they've been rejecting passports and confiscating visas. Thank you, Bailey. Tell Huber to meet me at the prison. Major Victoria didn't have any living family and no one knows where her husband is. I'll speak with the shepherd, he says. Bailey nods and sets off. The guards and a few dockmen clean up the blood, and Asbel helps load the body into the cart. On their way to the chapel, children stop and they're playing to pray. Merchants bow their heads, and anyone who served in the war salutes. The cart driver stops briefly at the major's house. Her front door is already covered in Lant Hill's famous flowers. Do you want to grab some of her effects, Lord Asbel? The driver asks. He considers it, but looking at its stark facade and drawn black velvet curtains, Asbel can't help but feel like it's a little too soon. Best to let everyone in town pay their respects and bring their flowers. He'll search the house when the overpowering scent dies down. There's a pall in the air. Highland has avoided the Imperial War for ten years. They defeated Fendel, 
They've done their part. But that doesn't change the fact that Highland sits on the edge of chaos. Once they reach the chapel, Sherry is already there with their daughter, Sophie. Wherever they are, he's home. Seeing them usually makes everything okay, but not even his wife and daughter can stop the ominous sinking in his gut. Sharia is seven months pregnant. What kind of father can he be if he can't protect his child? Please take her inside, Sharia says to the driver. Asbel doesn't see the shepherd anywhere. Where's Saray? He asks. He's inside, but he's not feeling well. Lady Carrie's with him now, Sharia admits. Not again. Asbel replies, shaking his head. Sharia looks back at Asbel. His downcast expression tugs at her heart. She touches his cheek gently, but he can't quite meet her eyes. Hey, look at me, she says gently. Reluctantly, he listens. No one blames you, she says quietly. He knows. That doesn't make it less of a failure. We'll talk later, all right? She gives him a kiss and goes to carry out her duty as Lady of Lant. It usually falls to Sharia or his mother to carry out funeral duties when there's no family present. Their daughter stays behind, however, gazing up at him, trying to comprehend what she just saw. Asbel? She asks. Are you sad? Sophie isn't very expressive in the best of times, but is still sensitive to those around her. Still, moments like these are still hard to understand. Yeah, I'm sad he says with a weary sigh. Major Victoria was part of this town. Even if she was mean, she didn't deserve to die that way. No one does. Sophie seems to accept the information. Who killed her? She asks. I'm afraid I don't know her name yet. Hubert and I are going to ask her, though. We don't know why she did it, Asbel answers. But she'll be brought to justice. Sophie just cocks her head curiously. Are you going to avenge Major Victoria? Asbel chokes. No, no, I mean, she's going to be put on trial, and we'll decide what to do with her. Sophie isn't satisfied with the explanation, and her sentence will be up to Hubert. What a cop-out. Sophie frowns as she watches the cart disappear behind the chapel. What's wrong, Sophie? We heard a lot of people like that, she says. When we were fighting in the war, people died. Her innocent observations are worse than a stab wound. It's been ten years. They have to talk about this sooner or later. He's raised her to live among humans, so it makes sense that she has some trouble grasping human concepts. But they put talk of the war away and focused on peace and progress. There's plenty of the latter to distract them from the horrors of Fendel and its mechanical city. He sighs and sits her back down on the bench. Sophie, back then we were defending ourselves and defending our home. They were ready to battle us to the death, and we had to be prepared to do the same or we'd lose. Asbel says gently, Major Victoria's killer attacked someone in cold blood. He wonders if that counts as lying. The Major did have a knife on her person, after all. The captain told me that those people were too sick to get better. Sophie adds. Asbel nods. Yeah, some of them were sick with demon blight. That's what happens when all the eleth in your body goes bad. He's explained this to her before, but she always struggles with the concept. She places a hand on her chest, trying to think of how her body would feel without any eleth. It must be hard for a Moloch to understand, since her body is practically made of it. But that can only happen when there's a lot of malevolence around. And malevolence is only around when there's no eleth. Sophie hangs on to that fact like a security blanket. And there's lots here. Yeah. You can even see bits of it in the sea, Asbel replies. Is the killer from somewhere else? Is she sick? Sophie asks. A new, horrifying thought dawns on Asbel. She very well could be. Asbel replies grimly. A demon blight isn't something you can cure easily. It doesn't matter. Major Victoria's murderer will still be sentenced to death. Will we be... Brought to justice, too? Sophie asks. Dear Maxwell, he is not equipped for this line of questioning. When he hesitates, Sophie thinks he wants her to elaborate. We killed people. Sick people. That's bad. Asbel considers this, 
and Sophie's bright, curious eyes burn into his soul. It is bad, Asbel says levelly. He laughs bitterly at himself. You've asked me a very hard question, Sophie. She doesn't care. Everything we went through after the war, everything that happened with Richard and with Lant, maybe that's our justice. He decides to be honest with her. A father should be honest with his child. I don't know, he says. I really don't know. But he gazes at her, smiling. These moments can be hard, but he has to admit, she's come such a long way. But I do know that you are a good person, and that I am a good person. So are Sharia and Hubert. This town is full of good, civilized people. Good people do good things. I definitely see more good in this town than bad. Sophie thinks for a moment, and gazes down at the road, as if they have the view of the town from here. She smiles, and Asbel holds back a sigh of relief. I see more good, too, she says. She looks up at her adopted father, and hugs him tightly. I see lots of good things. Asbel finds himself holding Sophie for just a little too long. Blood or not, it's his duty, his purpose, to protect his family and this town. They will live the lives they deserve. Sophie will never have to fight again. You two okay? Sharia asks, having returned. Well, they must have been talking for longer than they thought, because Sharia has not only left the chapel but changed back into her usual clothes. She's not so pregnant where she struggles to do things on her own, but she knows those days are coming. She's been in good health for most of her pregnancy. Asbel can't help but note her beautiful glow. Yes, I was just helping Sophie understand what's happened. A simple explanation. Though, he feels like he just cheated death. He gets to his feet, and Sophie follows. The chapel's cart driver meets them at the road. I'm going to meet Hubert at the prison. We'll need to interrogate the killer. Isn't that dangerous? Sharia asks. You'll give her exactly what she wants. That's true, but what choice do we have? If she's from somewhere like Malkuth, then this might be the only way to get her to talk. There has to be a reason for this, Asbel says, though a part of him believes she acted in cold blood. I want to search the Major's house when we get the chance, but not until Saray's feeling better. I'll need to bless it. Besides... She might have had a will, or something. Asbel helps Sharia and Sophie board the cart. There's nothing unusual about the body, Sharia notes. Although, Sharia trails off as they pass by the former major's home. The amount of flowers has doubled, filling the nearby streets with their overwhelming fragrance. Others sit at the house, praying. I wonder if she would have been nicer if she knew everyone would miss her so much. The prison is all the way on the other side of town, but Hubert walked here alone to collect his thoughts. It's a small place, made of stone, meant to keep minor criminals in for a few hours to a few months. They send major offenders to the capital, Windor. A weaker part of him just wants to file the necessary paperwork to get the killer commuted. But what kind of lords would they be if they just shoved their problems onto the king? The Launts are nothing if not effective leaders. Besides, Richard has his own problems. He spots the cart rolling up. He gives a nod to Sharia and Sophie, and waits for Asbel to kiss his goodbyes before joining him at the door. Hey, Hubert, Asbel says casually. Too casually. Hey, yourself, Hubert says, crossing his arms. He gives his brother a once-over. Gods, Sharia really just lets you walk around however you like, doesn't she? He asks rhetorically. Without asking for permission, he straightens Asbel's collar and roughly dusts off Asbel's white overcoat. He even picks at his hair, much to his dismay. I would have thought she talks some sense into you after all these years. Hubert served his time in the Stratton military and alongside Asbel during the war. Asbel is the personable one. If he's the one that has to look intimidating and official, then so be it. You're giving me too much credit, Asbel says just letting Hubert do what he likes. Has she said anything? No, Hubert said. We checked for Spyro's exposure, and we found a little bit under her fingernails, but that's about it. He's questioned war criminals, human traffickers, and killers before Strata seceded from Highland. 
But having something like this happen in their town just feels wrong. Strata was tainted by malevolence. So was Fendel and even parts of Windor. They took a horrendous beating during the hostilities. But Lant is pure and full of Elith. Shall we? He says. Asbel doesn't feel prepared, so he lets Hubert lead the way. The prison is silent, but quaking with fear. Their small collection of petty thieves and ruffians sit in terrified silence. They gaze at Hubert and Asbel pleadingly as they walk through the short corridor of cells. Guards try to stand at attention, but even they seem unable to keep themselves from dreading the young woman behind that cell door. The interrogation room is nothing like Strata's. There are no truth arts, no runes on the walls shining relentlessly into prisoners' eyes. There isn't even a way for anyone to listen in in case of a threat. Hubert just has to put his faith in the latch holding the young murderer's chains to the ground. Before they enter, Hubert turns to Asbel. If her hands get free, act at will. Asbel gets the message. Hubert doesn't wait for the anxiety to sink in and unlocks the door. By all means, the young lady sitting at the table is entirely unremarkable. Long black hair, skin tanned by hard field work, casual posture and ragged clothes. He could easily mistake her for your average ship hand. He notes her golden eyes are just like Saray's. She must be of Gandhi's descent. Hubert sits, but Asbel decides to stay standing. He rounds the room, standing directly behind her. He almost draws his sword, but there's no need to threaten her life. Yet. State your name, Hubert requests. Velvet Crow. Her accent eliminates aggression by the Olympian warfront but raises a whole host of other questions. Velvet Crow. Are you serious? Hubert asks. Would I be here if I wasn't? Velvet replies. Hubert glances at Asbel, but then goes back to the parchment in front of him. You expect me to believe that you, a murderer, I might add, are Velvet Crow? It's not a question. The killer merely smirks and leans back. Sister, Velvet Crow. She chides. How dare you? Asbel growls. His need for justice makes his fingers itch for his sword. He could cut off her head right now. But that wouldn't be proper justice for Major Victoria. Or the people of Lant. Sister Crow died in service of Asbel, Hubert warns. That's all he needs to ground himself. And he unwinds his hand from his hilt. Well. Sister Crow, pray tell what brings you here to our fair city, and to cause such a stir, no less. I was a crew member on the trade vessel called the Fiertia. I was on an ill-advised trip to Outer Malkuth, where we were caught up in a skirmish. The Fiertia was completely destroyed. Some of my crew survived, but we couldn't all escape Malkuth at once. Some were detained and their information confiscated. Hubert writes a few things down. I made it here in exchange for work aboard a Windorian military vessel. How long did this take you? Hubert asks. About four months, Velvet replies. Travel is unexpectedly expensive in Windor. I'd hope to find work here in Lond until I'm able to afford the trip home. Velvet sits back as far as her chains will let her. She can't see the taller lord behind her, but she knows he's a man of action, made of earth and toil. People like him are always the easiest to fool. Unfortunately, his brother is not so easily convinced. That was all very neatly rehearsed, Hubert states simply. I'm almost impressed that you managed to come up with such an unconvincing lie. Because if you're actually Sister Crow, I'd say being dead for ten years is long enough time to come up with a more believable story. Asbel's heart sinks. It's a good thing Hubert is here. He must stay calm. Rest assured, this criminal will be brought to justice honorably. Why don't you tell us why you're really here? Hubert says. I have our shepherd's notes on the body. The former major's death was quick, but painful, as if sliced by a giant claw. Witnesses say they saw a large shadow, then blood. There's pause. Then the room goes cold. 
if you brought malevolence into this province. You will die for it, Hubert declares in a dark whisper. There's malevolence here. Velvet remains undaunted, but I didn't bring it. She takes their shocked silence as a sign to continue. All I've been doing is trying to get to Gand. My vessel was scuppered off the coast of Malkuth, but that was some time ago, she says. I was looking for work when I felt it. A great big hole, right in the middle of your sleepy town. Asbel's heart jumps from his stomach to his throat. That's impossible, Hubert says with a roll of his eyes. He looks to Asbel for confirmation, but gets nothing in return. Velvet tries not to smirk. There hasn't been reports of malevolence in the area. Yes? His hesitation speaks louder than any answer he could give. Asbel! Only on the Fendelian border. Asbel says just as gravely, but... God, this must be why Sophie asked all those strange questions. He's been so wrapped up in the progress she'd been making. With news of Sharia's pregnancy, she moved on from the war. She started a garden. She's watching Sharia cook. She finally has the chance to be a child. Their daughter. She's been so normal. He didn't even think her questions were strange. It's something any girl with her experiences should ask. Sometimes, he forgets that she's not a normal little girl. He should have known something was wrong. Highland's war is over. His war is over. He will not suffer malevolence in this town. Not where his wife, brother, and children sleep. Without thinking, he wrenches Velvet's chair back, forcing her to face him. Where? It's not a question. I was headed north before she tried to stop me. She hardly blinks in the face of danger. I was told that the road I was on is a straight shot to her house. Asbel doesn't need to hear any more, and dashes out of the room. Hubert tries to run after him as his brother cries, Bailey! in the courtyard. Wait, Velvet says. It's not her fault the older brother left in a panic. If the younger lord is as smart as she thinks he is, he'll stay. Reluctantly, Hubert closes the door and prays that Asbel keeps a cool head. He wills him to think of Sharia and the people around him. He can't cause a panic in this town off of pure conjecture. Hubert has seen a lot of liars in his time. Some of them bargain, beg, and even cry. This so-called Velvet Crow hasn't even blinked. In fact, he'd go as far as to say that she's not entirely human. Why would she even come here? Clearly, she didn't intend to be caught, but she'll use the situation to her advantage. Hubert feels the hot lick of fear up his spine as he realizes that perhaps whatever she's searching for is beyond him. To his shame, he would have never believed her had she petitioned him like every other citizen. Come here. I want to show you something, she says, nodding him over. She's not surprised when he doesn't budge. Good thing he's smarter than his brother. Look on the back of my right shoulder. Hubert only vaguely notes that she flinches at his cold hands. He moves her threadbare collar down just far enough to see. He's seen this mark once before. Two symmetrical prongs with a circle in the middle, emphasizing the separation between two energies. Saray has the same brand on his hand. He keeps it covered at all times. However, Velvet's brand... It's horribly misshapen. Clearly a botched job led to red discoloration past her collar and down her back beyond his sight. Such scarring can only be caused by an extensive infection. If he had to guess, he'd say her entire arm's disfigured, considering that it's wrapped firmly in bandages. Sympathy pains won't cloud his judgment. What about it? Check the body. If it has this mark, then it's not Victoria Bell. It's a demon, Velvet says. Hubert frowns. You can tell just by the sound of her voice that they're going to find it. What does that mean? Do you know what's coming? Hubert asks, leaning against the table. Velvet leans back. She looks back to Hubert. The little brother Lord clearly loves this town just as much as the other one, but he's barely restrained by reason. She has no reason to help these people. She could very well let them be consumed by the malevolence planted here, and she could feed off of the spreading disease until she's strong enough to take on Gans 
entire theocracy. It's the ideal course of action. However, it doesn't guarantee survival. If left alone, the malevolence will turn this whole town into demons. She can't fight them all by herself. Have you ever heard of the Scarlet Knight? Scarlet Knights only happen in the complete absence of Eleth in the air. Hubert responds. It creates a hole in the aquasphere, which alters the reflection of light. Velvet has to admit, she might be outmatched on intellect. I served in the war with Fendel. I've seen it. He says dismissively. What about it? They haven't just happened in Fendel. But in Kimlaska? Malkuth? Hubert snorts in disgust. Even Gand. That takes him by surprise. She sees the wheels turning. Gand brims with Eleth. It's where Moloch's seraphim and spirits are born. Their arts are as powerful and unyielding as nature itself. Not even Fendel's Spyrex could consume that much Eleth. If you're not careful, this town is next on that list. Prove it, he demands. All you have is my word, Velvet replies. With her hands bound in chains, she can't do much. They would have killed her if they didn't believe her. Even better, if Malevolence had already taken hold of this town, they wouldn't have cared that she killed the Therian posing as this Major Victoria. She wonders what might have happened if she sent one of those petitions the Taller Lord mentioned. The nobles are so stupid. So obsessed with following the rules. She never intended to get caught. But she'll use these people's quaint sense of purpose to her advantage. By the way, has your shepherd been feeling, well, lately? Hubert feels panic claw up his spine. Velvet luxuriates in her good luck. The little brother lord can't stomach that all-knowing smirk any longer, and he sweeps out of the cell with bared teeth. He ignores the calls of the guard sitting outside of the cell. Stay here, he commands them. If she so much as rattles those chains, kill her. With that, Hubert tears down the hall. Finally alone, Velvet smells the fear around her. The human in her sympathizes. All it takes is a night to upend your entire life. She's lived through more of those nights than ought to be healthy. The demon in her delights in watching them scurry about like rats, scared of their own shadows. If the lords die tonight, this town will tear itself apart with fear and distrust. This day has not gone to plan. When she made her way to the malevolent source this morning, she didn't expect that someone was looking for her as well. The bloodlust got to her before common sense did. She dealt with the other Therian swiftly, but ended up getting caught. She considered making them chase her. She could have killed them all. But she needs to make it to Gand alive, not hunted. Be smart. Stay alive. These chains can't hold her. The little brother Lord clearly knew that, but was willing to stay in the room alone with her. He's smarter than his brother. She will do anything, and use anyone, to make it to East Gand. She estimates her cell will be full of guards and questions in about two hours' time. She might as well rest while she can. So, she sits back, and dreams of the salty air soon to grace her face, and the sound of her shipmates singing to the sounds of the waves. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. Yo, ho, ho and a bottle of rum. Drink to the devil had done for the rest. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. Hubert never gets the chance to catch up with Asbel, since he's already tearing through the city on horseback. Bailey managed to grab an aging nag from the barracks. They know they can't incite panic, but Asbel's gut twists at the thought of malevolence sprouting up in his town. He could call on Richard and ask for help, but... King or not, they can't rely on his old friend forever. This is his province. These are his people. He will defend and take care of them. He grips his father's sword, relying on it to keep him upright. If his old man could see him now, he'd be ashamed. There's a possibility that Crow just wants to spare her life, but he can't take any chances. Malachim, like Sophie, are so sensitive to malevolence. He can't risk her getting sick again. The wind picks up. The overpowering scent of flowers hits him before he even approaches the house. Petals dance in the gusting winds. 
He fully expects Lon Hill to be barren the next time he makes a trip to the outer settlements. He spares a glance at the sky. A storm is coming. Good. This will give Victoria's mourners a reason to stay in their homes without the guards making a fuss. He forces himself to greet them calmly, but there are still a few people lingering at the front door. Her neighbors, Gino to her right, and the twins to the left side. Misty and Mason. Mason, the shire of the twins, seems particularly shaken. He spoke to Victoria this morning. Gino sits in his usual chair outside his granddaughter's home, more guard dog than man. He notes the large hunting knife concealed on the man's belt. Asbel hasn't seen that thing in ages. Not only has Gino been old since Asbel was born, but the man can hardly walk without his cane these days. His granddaughter won't let him live alone. Still, he understands. Asbel's first concern is Mason. The boy has never been particularly brave or remarkable. He was only five when Fendel surrendered, even younger when his father died. Hard to believe the twins are old enough to work on the docks now. The boy was brought up well and taught to greet every familiar face he sees. Major Victoria never liked him. Mason? The boy jumps like he's been scolded. Have you two been out here all day? Asbel asks, noting their sunburns. Yes, sir. Misty answers for her brother. The house feels weird still, she admits. The hair stands up on the back of his neck. Malevolence spreads. We spoke to Major Victoria not six hours ago. She usually ignores us or says something nasty, but she just... waved. We thought maybe she was just being nice for once. It's been a while since she's come out of the house anyway. Misty all but repeats the witness statement she gave this morning, and it still vexes him. Malevolence makes people cruel and distrustful, not kinder. Is... is the killer in jail, Lord Asbel? Mason asks. He can't tell him that he's here under her advice. So he conjures up a smile for the boy and pats his shoulder. Yeah, he's behind bars and she can't hurt anyone now. He can't tell the poor kid that he's here under her advice. If you two don't want to sleep here tonight, I'm sure Sharia can make arrangements for you at Lont Manor. We want you to feel safe. The twins glance at each other. They clearly need time to think. Their house might feel strange, but sleeping in familiar surroundings is a luxury few have these days. Plus, you should talk to Hubert and Sharia before making any executive decisions. Thunder rolls overhead. He can hear the waves splashing against the wharf from where they're standing. There's a storm coming on. He motions Bailey over. We need to announce a curfew. Everyone off the streets before 8 p.m. tonight. Even the dock workers. Bailey tries not to gasp and nods slowly. Wait here. Asbel doesn't need keys to open the door. Clearing the mass of blooms and leaves away from the front stoop, he kicks open the door. The first thing Asbel sees is the mess. Major Victoria's house is only for one person. It's cozy, but lavishly decorated. However, all of those fancy paintings and knickknacks have been thrown to the floor. If he had to take a guess, he'd say that the Major was looking for something. None of her neighbors reported a commotion. Carpets are a rare luxury, but they're ripped from the floor. The thick velvet curtains blot out the light. Asbel steps into the house to light the nearest lamp, but as he does so, the floral scents from outside instantly fade. There's nothing but a disgusting, rancid smell. There's a loud wretch from behind him. He whips around to find that Mason has followed him in. Go stay with Bailey! he says sternly. Mason isn't the type to ask questions, and makes an about face outside. The first thing he notices is the floorboards in the far corner are pulled up. That must have been the hiding place for Major Bell's strongbox because it's completely pilfered. The house has been completely ransacked. Anything that could be seen as valuable has either been ripped from its frame or completely rifled through. But the Major only left her house this morning. He runs a hand through his hair and ties his wife's handkerchief over his nose. There's a corpse in this house. There's a small commotion outside, but Asbel can't be distracted now. He searches through the sitting room, dining room, and kitchen. All he finds is a destroyed house, a half-eaten breakfast, and testaments to the lonely life of a shut-in. Major Victoria deserved better than this. The smell drags him into the bedroom. The lamp doesn't reach here, but there's a crack of light shining through the door, cursing. 
Asbel hesitates. Everything Sister Crow's imposter told them could be a lie. There's always a chance that she's a murderer, trying to plan her escape. Not that there are many places to hide in a small town like Lant. What he sees in this room could prove her right. God damn it. Everything was fine until this woman, outsider, wandered into their midst like a curse. They haven't used the gallows in decades. He might make an exception. However, if there really is malevolence here, they might have to give her a commendation instead. Just what message will that send to his people? Misty and Mason are starting to make a commotion outside. He should hurry and get them to a safe place. He opens the door to find a fly and maggot infested body. Major Victoria died, tucked safely in her bed. This is where she should have been safest. Her death at Lant Port is horrible enough, but to have this happen in town, right under his nose, she's been here for days. Victoria might have been a bitter harridan, but she doesn't deserve this. She's still a part of this town, one of his people. He should have been able to protect her. Her eyes are closed. She was killed in her sleep. Totally defenseless. He approaches the body carefully. There's a deep hole in her forehead. He makes the mistake of trying to turn her over, but whatever made the hole went through the back of her skull and scrambled everything on its way through. Gore and bone spill onto the bed. Asbel's stomach roils traitorously. There's no art that can make this kind of wound. He's only seen it once before, in Fendel. They call it a firearm. A gift from their Olympian allies. The bullet in its high-powered chamber was so fast, it went through Captain Malik's chest and out of his back. He needs to find that weapon. Victoria Bell's imposter only had a knife on her when she was killed. It's warm today. She wasn't wearing many layers, so a firearm would attract too much attention out in broad daylight. She could have disposed of it, but Asbel figures that it couldn't hurt to search, just in case. He can't stay here for long. If there really is a hole full of malevolence under this house, he's at just as much risk as anyone else. He starts opening the drawers and turning over whatever hasn't been rifled through. He's invading a lady's privacy. He wouldn't be surprised if the body in the bed turned over. There's no weapon in the bedroom. However, he finds himself back in the sitting room. He thinks back to the floorboards wrenched out of place. It's the easiest hiding spot in this mess. Everything else has been turned over. Coastal towns only have stone foundations. There are no cellars here. So when he looks in the space left by the floorboards, there's nothing but masonry underneath. Luckily, he spots a wrapped bundle at the bottom of the supposedly empty strongbox. The wrapping is the same color as the box's lining. He would have missed it had he not bent down. Hubert needs to see this. Outside, four stairs greet Asbel with varying degrees of impatience. Misty opens her mouth to ask what's in his hand, but Mason stops her. Gino glares at the bundle in Asbel's hand. Their gazes burn the back of Asbel's head as he takes Bailey by the elbow and leads him out of earshot. Bailey tries to ask him what happened, but Asbel hands him the weapon. Firearms are such small things, yet they can end lives in a single bang. They were Fendel's weapon of choice. When they surrendered, Highland collected all of them and melted them down to assist with the Amarcian Enclave's inception. Just looking at this thing, Asbel knows it's newer, and therefore, more deadly. Take this to Lot Manor. Bailey tries to stay calm. Asbel never speaks so gravely. Do not stop for anyone. Do not let anyone see this. Gather the rest of the militia and tell them to initiate Windor Protocol. Once you're done, meet me at the chapel. Understood? Bailey clicks his heels together and salutes, a gesture he hasn't done since the war. Asbel fights the lump in his throat. This area needs to be quarantined. He turns back to the civilians. The twins might be children, but they're smart enough to be terrified. What happened? Misty asks. This time, Mason doesn't stop her. What did you find? Go inside and pack your things. Asbel looks to Gino. All of you. He turns back to the twins. I don't think it's safe for you to stay in the house tonight. We'll send word to your mother that you're spending the night at Lont Manor. In the morning, we'll send you to the Amarcian Enclave to be with her. I don't want you to be around here alone. Asbel turns to Gino. You and your family will be staying with us, too. I know it's short notice, but we have enough room for the both of you to stay with us. There's an innocent pause, and then... No. Gino, 
This is no time to be stubborn. Asbel struggles to keep the urgency out of his voice. It won't do any good to incite panic, but time is short. Gino hasn't aged well. It's natural for him to be stubborn, but there's no time. Asbel nearly considers using his sword to urge the old man along, but he's not that kind of lord. He opens his mouth to say more until Gino's granddaughter, Livy, comes to the front door. Perhaps she could sense the tension. Asbel doesn't bother speaking to Gino a second time. Sorry, Liv. I know it's short notice, but we're going to need you to pack up and take the kids to the manor. We need to investigate this area further. We don't want the kids to see if we can help it. It's not a lie, but there's another moment of steely silence as Livy sizes him up. They serve together as knights. She trusts them with her life. He wouldn't just have them up and relocate without a good reason. Okay, I'll have them ready in a minute. Livy takes her grandfather by the arm. Come on, Granddad. Gino doesn't budge. Granddad. We're fine here. Gino repeats. Look, if Asbel says it's time for us to go, we should listen. Livy protests irritably. She glances at Asbel pleadingly. It's only for a night, right? She asks. I can't promise that. Asbel says darkly. Livy opens her mouth to protest, but something in his voice makes her close it back. This isn't the time to argue. Someone died today. She won't put her kids in needless danger over a change of scenery. Livy shouts into the house, and her husband shouts an affirmative back. The children don't understand, but they do as they're told. The children aren't the hard part. Her grandfather is more mule than man. Let's go, Granddad! Livy pulls insistently. Gino is stubborn, but he's also frail. She can lift both her children over her shoulders, and yet her grandfather can't be moved. She looks to Asbel for help. Gino, look. Asbel's sudden lordly demeanor gives Livy pause. She's never heard him speak like this before. You can't stay here. There's... He hesitates. There's something bad underneath the Major's house. We need to investigate it. And we can't, won't, do it with your grandchildren around. Asbel shakes his head. Gino is a relic of Lant. Relics deserve respect. I'm sorry, but it's not a request. Pack your things and be ready in ten minutes. I'll help him. Mason suddenly appears at Asbel's side. Misty scrambles out of their house with bulging, badly packed suitcases. Asbel almost considers telling them to go ahead, but he doesn't want them walking alone. He should have brought more guards than just Bailey. Okay, fine. Just make it quick. Asbel says, stepping aside. Gino frowns at Mason's. Get away from me. Gino never sounds so firm. Livy and Mason take a step back, but Asbel reaches out and touches Gino's shoulder. The old man tenses and gazes down at Asbel's hand like it's cursed him. Listen, it's only for a little while, just until- STOP! Suddenly, Asbel reels back. A hot splash of blood hits his face. The ground hits the back of his head, and the world splits. Screams echo into his broken head. Something soft, warm, but heavy lands on top of him. Asbel's instincts know it's a body before his brain does. His vision focuses to see Mason's bloody split neck and his wide, lifeless eyes. Misty screams cut through the concussion. Blood streams down the back of his neck. Livy grabs him. He lets her drag him to his feet, and Misty scrambles over to her brother's body and cradles him. Her screaming sobs bring him to the sight of Livy's husband, wrestling Gino to the ground. He bangs the old man's wrist against the nearest surface, desperate to knock the hunting knife from his hands. There's no way Gino can overpower a man in his prime, but in a flash, Gino rolls him over and stabs him like a pincushion, in full view of his granddaughter and great-grandchildren. Asbel and Livy can't pull him off until the fifth stab. Gino lets out an unholy screech. What's wrong with you? Livy screams. Motherly instinct wins over horrified bewilderment, and she plants herself in the doorway over her husband's corpse. The commotion draws people out of their houses. Gino throws Asbel off, and his vision doubles. He blindly tackles the old man. 
He slashed in the chest and cries out as he's stabbed. The militia watchtower bells start to ring, shaking Asbel's addled sight even more. Livy loops her arms under her grandfather's. She has to hold him in place until the militia comes. She has to protect her children. She has to help Asbel. She has to... Livy flies backwards. Her head hits the cobblestone so hard, her neck bends and stays that way. Someone screams again. He has to end this. His vision can't focus. He doesn't know where Mason's blood begins and his blood ends. A sick smile splits Gino's face. The old man jerks forward. Asbel's brain screams. The Lord in him doesn't want to draw his sword. The Lord wants to believe that Gino can be subdued. But there's a baser half that wants to survive. He picks one and grabs his sword. A flash erupts from his scabbard, and he hits the old man with prejudice as he slashes him across the chest. Gino's body collapses into bloody pieces. The adrenaline leaves Asbel all at once. His wounds buckle his knees. He stares down at his hands. What a selfish decision. He doesn't know whose blood this is. His? Mason's? His father's? Dizziness doesn't let him think about it. The world pitches and tilts. He stumbles forward into a firm pair of arms. The tinny ringing in his ears overwhelms his brother's voice shouting at him. He can't answer. Sherry is going to be so disappointed.